Good morning. Glad everyone's here this morning. You turn to the book of Jude. To make it easier, go to Revelation, go one page to the left. You know, slavery is not a fun thing to talk about. It's not a very pleasant topic. Um, 65, when, when they abolished slavery. Slavery, as bad as it is, slavery itself is never condemned in the Bible. The treatment of slaves sometimes is, but slavery itself is never condemned in the Bible. Now, it was very different in Bible times. Um, there were rules that had to be followed for, for masters and for slaves. But slavery in the Bible is nothing like we're used to when we think of slavery. We think of the, the European and the American um, slavery. The word slave, the word that we get slave, is from the Greek word um, doulos. Sometimes that, that's translated uh, as, as servant. But, but the meaning of, of doulos is it, someone who belongs to another, and they have no ownership rights themselves. They are literally a piece of property of their owner. If you remember the uh, Paul's letter to, to Philemon um, and the slave Onesimus, uh, Onesimus had been an escaped slave, and he, Paul took him under his wing and converted him. Um, well, the penalty for an escaped slave could be death. And there was no repercussion for, for the owner, for the master. He could do what he wanted with him because basically a slave was a piece of property. Well, Jude, he wore that tag doulas as being someone who belongs to another, someone without any ownership rights. Jude, if you will, he, he wore that tag as a badge of honor. Jesus wasn't here. Jesus had, had risen. And so Jude, he, he became a slave of Jesus, a slave with no rights. He, he had nothing. His life was completely and totally that of Jesus. Jude lived as property of Jesus to do what Jesus would have him to do. And folks, as Christians, as slaves to Jesus, we're called to persevere. And sometimes we're called to do things that may or may not seem very pleasant. Turn to Jude, verse 1. It says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Notice in verse 1, Jude, right off the bat, makes a very clear distinction. He says that Jude, in Mark 6, 3, where there's a list of Jesus' brother, it's Judas, but it's the same Jude. Jude says he's a brother of James, but a slave to Jesus. There are other times... In, in, in the New Testament, James, in James 1.1, 1, 1, starts off, James, a servant or slave. It's that same word. Peter, in 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, says, Simon Peter, a servant. Again, that same word, doulas, a slave. Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, 1.1, 1, 1, says, Paul and Timothy, <coughs> servants or doulas. It's that same word that means slaves. These gospel writers, these letter writers, are just so committed to Christ, to Jesus, that they are literally slaves to Jesus. Why would they be called? Why would they become that, that, that love that God has for us, where we're called? God chooses to love us. And so every time Jude uses that word "beloved," it's to, to evoke 
the emotion, the, the feeling that we're slaves to God because God loves us. God has chosen us. And he continues verse 2, say, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So as Christians, we need to humble ourselves and become slaves to Jesus. Folks, part of that becoming slaves to Jesus is sometimes we need to talk about things that we don't want to talk about. Pick up in verse 3. It says, Beloved, there's that word beloved again. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our Lord, excuse me, who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Beginning in verse 3, Jude wanted to write about their common salvation. Talking about salvation, that would be fun to talk about. That would that, that'd be easy to talk about. It would be a happy subject. It would be cool to talk about common salvation that we Christians have through Christ. But he couldn't. He says, I found it necessary to write to you, appealing to you, to contend for the faith. Contending for the faith with the Christians that Jude is writing to took precedent. Now, why did he feel necessary to write about contending for the faith and not talk about salvation? Verse 4 says, certain people have crept in. Crept in unnoticed. They're ungodly people. People who pervert the grace of God. Specifically, Jude is talking about false teachers. In Ephesians 6, 12, Paul takes it a step further and Paul talks about rulers and authorities and cosmic powers. And Colossians even goes on to say human traditions. These things have crept in and, and, and were weakening the church. And Jude had to say, look, I have to write to you to warn you about these things that you need to contend for the faith. By not contending for the faith, let's look at what happened. This is a warning that Jude gives. Verse 5. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew, knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness, until the judgment of that great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Folks, Jew talks about things that his audience would be familiar with. He talks about those who were, who were rescued out of Egypt but they never made it to the promised land. Not even Moses. Just Caleb and Joshua. Because they turned their back on the Lord. They let these other things creep in. And they didn't make it to the promised land. He talks about angels who are, who are destined for, for eternal chains. And he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, stories that, that, that his audience would understand how, how Sodom and Gomorrah were just completely destroyed. Because they had let these things creep in. They had let the, 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 the lust and, and the pleasures of the earth. And only Lot and his family were saved from Sodom and Gomorrah. And even Lot's wife, when she disobeyed and turned her head, became a pillar of salt. This is what Jude is warning against. This is what Jude says we need to contend for the faith. Go back to verse 3. 
talked about contending for the faith. He said it was once, that for the faith, excuse me, that was once for all delivered to the saints. But when Jude is talking about the faith that was delivered, he's talking about the gospel. He's talking about the Bible. This is it. This is the faith. This is the message. This is what we have. Delivered once for all people. Folks, that means we don't need the Book of Mormon or the Koran or a Baptist tenet or even the Catholic Church with their traditions that they say are just as important as the gospel. All that came later. All that's man-made. Jude says that this is the gospel. This is what we need. This is the faith that we need to contend for. Folks, sin is sin. If sin, if it was a sin 2,000 years ago, it's a sin today. No false teacher, no human tradition, no ruler, no authority, nothing is going to change that. Sin is sin. Hebrews 13.8 tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. Another thing we need to do as slaves to Jesus, we need to accept how God has made us. Beginning to verse 8, says, Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious one. Now, Jude is talking specifically about false teachers, but look at some of the examples he uses. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people... The false teachers blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walk in the way of Cain and abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are the hidden reefs at your love feast, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, Waterless clouds swept along by winds. Fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame. Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. The Archangel Michael, Cain, Balaam, Korah, they all rebelled against God. Now, folks, we don't know the story of the Archangel Michael but they did. Jude's audience did. And Jude uses him as an example. These, these false prophets, they come along, and like them, they try to get their own glory, their own satisfaction, not God's. And that's what Jude is warning against. Folks, sometimes it's intentional. As Jude said in verse 4, for certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Sometimes it's unintentional. People have just been taught wrong. Folks, God has a judgment for these people, for the people who will teach wrong, for the people who distort the message of God. Folks, I don't like being deaf. It's not any fun not being able to hear anything. But you know what? I can't complain because God made me that way. That was his choice. He decided to do that. And that's fine. I live with it. I accept it. Paul says so much in Romans 9, 20. Paul writes, But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Well, what is molded? Say to the molder, Why have you made me like this? I can't question God. If I do, my judgment's already determined. And finally, folks, to be slave to Jesus, to 
persevere, excuse me, to be slaves, we must persevere and show mercy. Beginning in verse 17. But you must remember, beloved, again, that word beloved again. You must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, the void of the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Verse 22, and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Folks, the world is full of lost people. Among them are the scoffers, people who will follow their ungodly passions, worldly people people who cause divisions. Folks, we are in this world, but we're not to be part of this world. John 17, verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Folk, we're sojourners. This world is not our home. Peter writes in the second letter, which is actually written about the same time as the, book, as the letter Jude wrote. Peter says that do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Folks, the only way that those who are lost are going to reach repentance is if we, as Christians, truly become slaves to Christ and persevere and show mercy to those who need mercy. Folks, Jesus never condoned sin, and neither should we. But Jesus never avoided sinners. Look at the stories. Nicodemus, the woman at the well, the lady caught in adultery, the blind, the lame, the crippled, the demon-possessed. Jesus never turned anyone away. Look at who he called. He called the little children. He called Zacchaeus, his apostles. He called Matthew, a tax collector. Simon, a political activist. Jesus called people to him because he loved them and he wanted to show them a better way. Jesus ate with sinners. He dined with sinners and tax collectors because he had to be with the people to show them his love for people. He never partook in their sinful activities. He never condoned what they were doing, but he spent time with these people, giving them the message of the gospel. And usually he would close, or when he left these people, he would say, go and send no more. He wouldn't make them. He left it to be their choice. It was their choice if people listened. Last week we talked about Jesus on the cross being hung between two thieves. One of them said, Father, remember me in paradise. The other one didn't. Same Jesus, same Savior. One accepted the message one didn't. Look at his apostles the night he was betrayed. Same message. They had just spent three years or so with Jesus, just about every day, walking with him, 
eating with him, learning from him, hearing from him, seeing his miracles. The night he was betrayed, Peter got, Peter went out and wept bitterly. Judas didn't. He went out and hung himself. It's the same message. We have to deliver the message. Jesus isn't here to deliver it. We have to deliver the message. Look, we can't turn people away just because we don't like their lifestyle or just because of how they act. We have to be with people, but we have to persevere. We have to be strong in the faith. We can never condone or approve of people's sinful behavior, but we have to be with them. We have to be strong. We have to defend the faith, and we have to show them a better way. Folks, Jude closes with perhaps one of the sweetest boxologies ever written. Verse 24 says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Folks, it's all about Jesus. Everything we do, it's all about Jesus. Are you ready to be a slave to Jesus? Are you ready to wear that badge proudly that says, yes, I am a servant, I am a slave to Jesus. All that's mine is his. Folks, if he can help you in any way, let us know. Please come. I'll be seeing him singing.